Hey everyone, welcome back to The Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today we're going to be asking, what is philosophy? And what are some resources for thinking philosophically? So, without further ado, let's dig in. So, as most of you guys know, philosophy comes from philosophia, which just means the love of wisdom. But philosophy is, of course, much more than that, and so I'm going to be looking at three different ways of understanding philosophy. Philosophy is a unique discipline in both its methods and in the nature and breadth of its subject matter. In short, it's really the systematic and rational study of the fundamental nature of reality, our cognitive or epistemic access to that reality, and how to act within reality, and how to think about it, really. But reality consists of all sorts of different things, right? So philosophy then pursues questions in pretty much every dimension of human life, and its techniques apply to problems in any field of study or endeavor. It seeks to establish st standards of reasoning, evidence, and justification, and in so doing, it concerns the analysis and evaluation of arguments, their assumptions, and their implications. So the philosophical evaluation of ideas and issues takes many forms, but focus is often placed on the meaning of an idea and its justification, coherence, and relations to other ideas. Consider, for instance, knowledge, right? What is its nature and extent, right? How much can we know? What is knowledge? Must we always have evidence in order to know something? What can we know about the thoughts and feelings of others, or about the future, or about ultimate reality? What kind of knowledge, if any, is fundamental or foundational to other forms of knowledge? Is knowledge even possible? Similar kinds of questions arise concerning art and morality and religion and science and, and so much more. And so philosophy really explores all of these. So philosophy, however divided it may be, nevertheless has a collective body of knowledge that has been arrived at via logical analysis and reasoned evaluation. And so this first sense of philosophy is really philosophy as both the discipline and as the body of knowledge gained from that discipline. So this is kind of the first sense of philosophy. But there are, of course, two other senses that I wish to explore, and it is to these that I turn next. So philosophy, of course, is much richer than a mere collection of reasoned conclusions or the discipline that does that collecting. It's also a way of thinking, a way of critically engaging ideas. Philosophy is a process, a process of using the methods and tools of rational inquiry to arrive at reasoned conclusions. Formulating and developing arguments, objections, defeaters, analyses, evaluations of assumptions and implications, and so much more are but a mere glimpse into the conception of philosophy as a process, as a way of thinking, as a way of living, really. And then the third kind of understanding of philosophy uh, that we might, we might level is philosophy as dispositional. Right, so at the beginning of this video, I mentioned that philosophy comes from the root words philosophia, meaning love and wisdom, respectively. And so philosophy is really the love of wisdom. But, you know, this, this definition transcends a mere love for wisdom or knowledge or truth. This kind of dispositional definition regards philosophy as really the cultivation of intellectual virtues and dispositions. Philosophy so construed concerns developing the character and personality of a critical thinker, a rational human being, and a philosopher, really. And so what are some of these intellectual virtues? Well, you know, one of them would be something like intellectual humility, right? Having the humility to admit when you do not know something, or are insufficiently informed on a certain topic, and acknowledging that there are others who have studied the exact same stuff in more depth, more depth than you, but who have different conclusions. Intellectual courage. You know, that, that means having the courage to challenge both your own and others' beliefs, including the ingrained assumptions most people take for granted. This, it also includes having the courage to question authority and demand rigorous standards of evidence and or reasoning, both for yourself and others. Intellectual perseverance, right? Merely reading one philosophical or apologetic book does not mean that your inquiry has ended. Intellectual perseverance really refers to one's disposition not to stop at one argument, but rather to pursue the argument further by reading different perspectives on the issue, including objections to the argument in question. Right? Those with intellectual perseverance do what it says. They persevere beyond a single perspective in hopes of finding the truth behind an issue. 
It also involves both uh, skepticism and open-mindedness, a balance between the two, with skepticism helping one question claims and demand evidence or philosophical reasoning, realizing that no idea is sacrosanct or immune to criticism, but also open-mindedness, the ability to consider alternative viewpoints, uh, not to presuppose the falsity of other viewpoints without you know, proper investigation and without preconceived biases or prejudices. Philosophy as dispositional also involves strongly valuing reason and truth. Intellectual charity, moreover, is yet another one of these dispositions, right? It involves construing opposing viewpoints in the most charitable way possible, that is, representing their claims and arguments correctly without any straw manning, and perhaps trying to steel man their arguments. So those are three kind of different ways to understand philosophy. Philosophy as a body of knowledge or as a discipline, and then secondly, philosophy as a kind of way of thinking, as a kind of process, uh, as a kind of way of living. And then thirdly, a more dispositional kind of philosophy, where you're cultivating these, these intellectual and moral virtues. So with those three different ways of understanding philosophy, I think it's useful to at least focus on the first way, like philosophy as a discipline, uh, and, and talk about the, the various branches of philosophy uh, that are explored by uh, thinkers both past and present. And so really, in, in broad strokes, these are going to be things like logic, ethics, metaphysics, and epistemology. And so I just want to give a sketch or an introduction to some of these to help you guys get a greater understanding of what it is philosophy does and what it's interested in. So logic is concerned really with the structure of our reasoning. It helps us assess how well our premises support our conclusions and to see what we're committed to accepting when we take a view. Logic also helps us to discover assumptions we did not know we were making and to formulate the minimum claims that we must establish if we are to prove or inductively support our point. Ethics is really the branch of philosophy dedicated to the study of morality, right? So we're talking about the nature and meaning of moral values, uh, you know, their truth value, whether or not they can be true. We're talking about the nature of morality in its relation to human action, what kinds of entities can be considered, can be considered moral agents or patients, the nature of uh, intrinsic moral worth or dignity, as well as specific moral acts and moral theories. Um, so, you know, theories concerning what matters in moral action, like, is it just the means by which you bring about certain things that matters? Um, do circumstances and consequences also play in? Is it just your intentions that matter? And so on. Uh, it also concerns itself with moral systems and obligations and various moral concepts like right and wrong, good and evil, just and unjust, virtue and vice, and so on. So that's really ethics. Metaphysics uh, really just seeks basic criteria for determining what sorts of things are real, right? Like, are there mental, physical, and abstract things such as numbers? Or, you know, is there just the physical and the spiritual? Or is it merely just matter and energy that exists? Uh, are persons highly complex physical systems? Or do they have properties not reducible to anything physical? Uh, does time dynamically pass? Or is it, like, static and unchanging? You know, metaphysics is, in essence, a large field of philosophy dedicated to studying all these things, and really just existence, the nature of reality, um, the nature of cause and effect, abstract objects, and so much more. Final, you know, main branch of philosophy is epistemology, which deals, of course, with knowledge. Uh, it deals with the nature of knowledge, the means by which we acquire knowledge, right, the sources of knowledge. Uh, it deals with whether knowledge is even possible, so that's the challenge of skepticism, right? It deals with justification. What is justification? What does it take to be justified or warranted in believing something? Uh, it studies beliefs, including things related to beliefs, like credences and uh, propositional attitudes. It also talks about the comparative reliability or knowledge-conferring status of different sources of knowledge, like experience and reason and intuition and so on. So again, these are just really broad brush strokes of what philosophy is. And I, I really think that helps people understand what philosophy is when you kind of see all these different predominant sub-branches within it and the various questions and problems that they seek to address. So with that out of the way, let's go into some of the important sub-branches of philosophy to get, you know, to get a greater sense of what philosophy is. There are lots of important sub-branches, and I'm just, I just picked four kind of at random. Um, so I just said philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, philosophy of religion, and philosophy of science. But, you know, you could go on and on and on, like political philosophy, philosophy of law, philosophy of medicine, and so on. Um, but just, just to give you guys a sense of what these sub-branches are and do and ask, uh, let's just start with philosophy of mind. So philosophy of mind is really a, a sub-branch of philosophy that emerged from metaphysical concerns with the mind and mental phenomena, 
right? So it addresses not only the possible relations of the mental to the physical and predominantly to the neurophysiological goings on in the brain, but also the many concepts that seem to have uh, some kind of essential connection to the mind, right? So things like beliefs, desires, emotions, feelings, sensations, intentionality, and will and personality and, and other kinds of things. Philosophy of religion, of course, seeks to understand the concept of God, um, as well as, you know, whether God exists, if God exists, what is his nature like, and how God relates to uh, the world around us. It also, of course, seeks to understand the various uh, divine attributes that we might predicate of God or uh, the different models of God on offer. It also seeks to evaluate uh, religion as such and religious belief in particular in, and specifically its epistemic status. So uh, whether or not religious experiences can be uh, justification conferring and, and so on. And then philosophy of science, it really clarifies the quest for scientific knowledge and the results yielded by that quest. Uh, so it explores the nature of scientific evidence, uh, scientific laws, uh, scientific explanations, uh, what is theorizing, scientific theorizing, what are the various uh, theoretical virtues within science, um, the role of parsimony or simplicity, and how it is to be balanced with explanatory power. Um, it, it really also concerns uh, the relations that hold between the various branches of science, like uh, you know whether or not some branches of science are ultimately reducible to other ones. Um, and it also concerns whether or not the unobservable posits of our best scientific theories exist and whether our best scientific theories are approximately true. And then finally, philosophy of language. Um, it, this really deals with the nature of meaning, um, mental content, the relations between words and things, the nature of, of reference and signification, uh, theories of language learning, uh, you know, various distinctions between different kinds of uses of language, so like literal, figurative, metaphorical, and so on. So hopefully, through this articulation of the predominant branches of philosophy, as well as some of the important sub-branches of philosophy, you guys are able to gain a better understanding of what philosophy is. But, like, why should we care about this, right? Like, what's the value of philosophy? Does this even matter? Um, you know, we know what it is now, but why should we care about it? So, when we're talking about the value of something, we need to distinguish between its instrumental value and, potentially, its intrinsic value. So something's intrin intrinsically valuable, you know, just in case it's valuable in and of itself, right? Things like love and justice and beauty and knowledge and truth and friendship and happiness are great examples of things that we might plausibly take to be intrinsically valuable or intrinsically worthwhile in and of themselves. They're good in and of themselves, not for some other purpose or not for the sake of something else that we get by means of them. Um, by contrast, instrumental value uh, refers to something that's, you know, good or valuable, not necessarily in and of itself, but rather as a means to acquire or do something else that has value. So, for instance, money, right? We don't really take money to be valuable in and of itself, right? We value money instrumentally insofar as we can use it as a means to ends that we consider intrinsically valuable, like sustaining a family or... Uh, acquiring happiness, or listening to philosophy videos. So, uh, with these two notions of value in hand, instrumental and intrinsic value, we can start to better appreciate uh, what the value of philosophy is. Now, for those who have actually studied philosophy, I think that uh, the instrumental values of, of philosophy are really evident, right? Because many of, of the methods and tools of, of critical and rational thought and reasoning and argumentation that you develop in philosophy are pretty much useful in any other domain of your life and in any other field of inquiry. So philosophy, firstly, develops, refines, and cultivates problem-solving skills, right? I mean, it enhances, in arguably a way that few other disciplines do or can, one's ability to analyze concepts and definitions, arguments and problems. It aids in analyzing problems, evaluating various ways that it can be solved, and arriving at the best possible solution to the problem in question. It also contributes to your ability to organize ideas and extract what is essential from large amounts of information. And it also enhances your ability to find hidden or underlying assumptions behind claims and arguments, which is, of course, an incredibly valuable tool in the workplace and in general problem solving. It also really kind of broadens one's horizon and outlook on life, right? I mean, studying the ways thinkers of the past and present have come to various conclusions allows you to see the world in a more unifying way from a bunch of different perspectives and really to help you uh, come to the truth on various aspects of life. 
so thirdly, I think philosophy helps develop and enhance your communication skills. Uh, it really gives you the essential tools needed to express your views in a coherent, clear, precise, and logical way, really. Um, I mean, that's really due to the nature of philosophy, since it revolves around precision and systematic argumentation. You know, the, formula, the formulation of uh, claims and premises that, and, and the relations between the premises and the conclusion, right? It, it really just helps you uh, eliminate imprecision, vagueness, ambiguity, and so on in both your writing and your reasoning and, of course, your communicating. Philosophy also really, I think, trains your persuasive powers, right? I mean, it can give you the tools necessary for the clearer formulation of sound arguments, apt examples, uh, you know, cutting thought experiments, and so on. And so it aids in your ability to be convincing. Uh, philosophical reading, writing, and dialogue, which are all integral parts of a philosophical education, help you build, defend, and criticize both your own and others' views. Uh, I think uh, a fifth instrumental value of philosophy is that it, it greatly helps with writing skills. And this is, of course, related to communication skills. Philosophy develops argumentative writing and ability to construct forceful examples. And so it really develops your ability to structure and organize your writing as well as your communication. There are a bunch of other benefits as well, and I don't have the space or the time to uh, explicate them all here. Um, but really, I guess one further benefit is a greater understanding of other disciplines, their ways of knowing, their sources of knowledge, their inherent limitations, and their relations to other disciplines. Philosophy is like a king interdisciplinary enterprise. Uh, and, and finally, I think philosophy helps you... Um, really just analyze problems and consider them from multiple points of view. Um, and when you combine that with precision and clarity of argumentation, I think it makes philosophy an incredibly instrumentally valuable field of study. But I also think that philosophy is deeply intrinsically valuable. I mean, it's a quest for understanding life's biggest questions, right? Does God exist? Does free will exist, right? How are we to make sense of moral responsibility? Do minds exist? If they do, what's their nature? Are we just physical brains? Are we something irreducible to physical brains? Do we survive past our deaths? The pursuit of these fundamental questions seems, at least by my lights, to be intrinsically valuable, right, in and of itself. It allows you to contemplate existence and transcend the banalities of everyday life. Philosophy's ultimate goal really is knowledge, truth, goodness, clarification and precision and understanding of reality and our concepts. I think that these things are really intrinsically valuable, and that's really just inherent to the methodology and subject matter of philosophy. They really make life worth living. It prevents you from having an unexamined life, which, as Socrates said, is not worth living. I want to end my discussion of the intrinsic value of philosophy with a, a profound and cutting and I think beautiful quotation from the American Philosophical Association, or APA. So they say that philosophy is the systematic study of ideas and issues, a reasoned pursuit of fundamental truths, a quest for a comprehensive understanding of the world, a study of the principles of conduct, and much more. Indeed, philosophy is, in a sense, inescapable. Life confronts every thoughtful person with some philosophical questions, and nearly everyone is guided by philosophical assumptions, even if unconsciously. The problem-solving, analytical, judgmental, and synthesizing capacities philosophy develops are unrestricted in their scope and unlimited in their usefulness. Wisdom, leadership, and the capacity to resolve human conflicts cannot be guaranteed by any course of study, but philosophy has traditionally pursued these ideals systematically, and its methods, its literature, and its ideas are of constant use in the quest to realize them. Sound reasoning, critical thinking, well-constructed prose, maturity of judgment, a strong sense of relevance, and an enlightened consciousness are never obsolete, nor are they subject to the fluctuating demands of the marketplace. The study of philosophy is the most direct route, and in many cases the only route, to the full development of these qualities. So that's really my summary of both the intrinsic and the instrumental value of philosophy. So to give you guys uh, an even better understanding of philosophy and to help you guys dig into it, uh, I want to end the video with a consideration of two more things. First is a map of philosophy. So I think whenever you're getting into a discipline or whenever you're trying to understand a discipline or trying to understand it further, even if you're an expert, it's great to have a kind of map of the entire conceptual terrain of the field or uh, object of understanding. 
right? And so when we're talking about philosophy, this would come in terms of a map of philosophy, which uh, the person who runs carnades.org has done for us. I will have a link to the video wherein he describes this map of philosophy. He goes through it, he works through it, he talks about uh, the epistemology of things, the metaphysics, the philosophy of mind, he starts with the informal logic and logic and philosophical methods. Uh, he goes also into the history and traditions of philosophy as well as uh, aesthetics, value theory, uh, ethics, and social and political philosophy. So, uh, you know, he goes through these things that I was uh, articulating earlier, you know, like the important branches and sub-branches of philosophy, and he kind of shows them their, not only their relations to one another, but also kind of where they're situated with respect to one another. And it's really overall just an excellent explanation of what philosophy is, what it does, and, and so on. So I think you guys will really benefit from that. Again, I will have the link in the description that you can check out uh, the video wherein he explains this. And then finally, I often get asked, what are the best books? What are some of the books that I need in order to be able to think philosophically, to be able to, to reason and, and think critically about, you know, really anything, but really the fundamental nature of reality? And so to that end, I've put together 13 book recommendations for thinking philosophically. And so I think that you guys should pick up each and every one of these and read them because well, without a doubt, they will improve your, your ability to think uh, critically and philosophically about the nature of reality. And this is true both for people who are just being introduced to the subject and for people who are seasoned experts in the subject. Every single one of these books has things that are going to be valuable to everyone. So the first two are, of course, probably one of my favorites, Julian Bagini's uh, The Philosopher's Toolkit. It is what it says. It's giving you a toolkit, a variety of different tools and methods uh, and, and, and conceptual distinctions that you'll be able to use when you're thinking philosophically about a given topic. And then the one on the right here, which is the Critical Thinking Toolkit, uh, it's also put out by Wiley Blackwell. It's sort of like a you know, it's like, it's a cousin of the other one, essentially. Uh, and again, it goes through, it really helps hammer down a lot of the things that the Philosopher's Toolkit doesn't, but that are also absolutely critical to, criti to critical thinking, right? Absolutely essential to critical thinking. What is that? Well, it goes through the variety of cognitive biases that we have. It talks about the psychological literature there um, and helps you become aware of those biases and gives you techniques for mitigating them. And it also goes through uh, a different reasoning strategies and things like that so that you don't really get fooled by baloney or malarkey, as Joe Biden would put it. The next two books within my 13 book recommendations for thinking philosophically are absolutely brilliant. Once again, they are put out by Wiley Blackwell. The one on the left is just the arguments, 100 of the most important arguments in Western philosophy. And boy, oh boy, does it really mean 100 of the most important arguments in Western philosophy. It systematically goes through some of the most important arguments that have been formulated within the Western philosophical tradition concerning uh, a variety of the most important fields and subfields of philosophy. So so it goes through philosophy of religion. It goes through a variety of the different arguments in there. Uh, I think it has, uh, you know, a number of Aquinas' arguments. And it, 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 they're all developed by uh, scholars within the relevant field, right? So it goes through philosophy of religion. It has uh, Dr. Timothy Paul, for instance. He goes through, um, I think it's Aquinas' first three or maybe first five, or first five. <laughs> Aquinas' is five ways. So it has a philosophy of religion section. It has philosophy of science section, uh, metaphysics, epistemology, and so on. And so this book is so beautiful, so brilliant, and uh, it, you just, you need to pick it up. Uh, and then the next one is bad arguments, 100 of the most important fallacies in Western philosophy. And so fallacy detection is, again, absolutely critical for um, engaging philosophically uh, both discussions with other people and topics of interest. So uh, this one contains, as it says, 100 of the most important fallacies in Western philosophy uh, that I think will really aid you in your ability to think uh, critically and rationally. This one's kind of a classic. Uh, it's Anthony Weston's A Rule Book for Arguments. Um, this one is about really argumentation in general, how to construct arguments, how to evaluate arguments, to pinpoint underlying assumptions. It goes through um, different fallacies of even statistical reasoning, for instance. So it goes through the base rate fallacy and a bunch of other things that, that come up. It's just an excellent, excellent book for uh, honing your ability to construct and evaluate arguments and to 
draw out implicit assumptions or consequences of arguments. All right, these next two are like unparalleled. Like they are so good. Um, I have the, the one on the left just right next to me, and I, I would like to read uh, the table of contents to you um, because uh, it's, it's just so wonderful. The book is, as you can see on the screen, uh, Philosophy One, A Guide Through the Subject. Uh, it's an edited collection uh, from Oxford University Press. So the contents of this, uh, these are the chapters, and they're all, they're each like something like 60 pages each, right? So they are very thorough. It's a wonderful, wonderful introduction, survey, and contribution to the literature for each of these things. And it's accessible to people who are um, sort of in the beginning stages of their philosophical journey. So the contents, it starts with epistemology, philosophical logic, methodology, the elements of philosophy of science, metaphysics, the philosophy of mind, so that's the first, like, 335 pages of it. And then it goes into ancient Greek philosophy, the pre-Socratics and Plato, and then ancient Greek philosophy, Aristotle. And then it goes into modern philosophy, the rationalists and Kant. And then it also goes into modern philosophy, the empiricists. And so that's the second part of the book, and then that goes up to, like, page 545. And then the, the third and final part of the book is on ethics and aesthetics, and that goes to page, like, 600. 29 or something. And so that's that's the philosophy of one. And this is just, it's such an excellent, excellent book for thinking philosophically. Um, yeah, I would just say you need to get both of these. And then the next one is literally the companion to this one. It's further through the subject. So this one gets into a lot of the things that this one didn't get into. So for instance, this one has a philosophy of religion uh, chapter and a whole host of other brilliant, excellent material. Okay, and then these next two, well, uh, shameless plug incoming. <laughs> uh, anyway, and it, this first one on the left, I think this one was actually published in 2020. Um, and actually, for my patrons, uh, these guys actually got a free copy of this one on the left. Um, all my patrons do. So if you're interested in getting a free copy of this one on the left, I highly recommend becoming a patron and helping support me and helping me pay my rent. Anyway, this is the philosophy major's introduction to philosophy, concepts, and distinctions. It goes through lots of different distinctions that you can make within philosophy. Philosophy is, in large part, about drawing conceptual distinctions so as to allow us to come to truth on a variety of different matters. So it goes through things like de re and de dicto modality. It goes through things like A theories and B theories of time and different views of persistence, like endurantism and perdurantism. It goes through, um, you know, semantic and justificatory internalism and externalism. Uh, it goes through uh, modality and logic. It, it's, it's so wonderful. And it says the philosophy major's introduction to philosophy, but it's kind of actually for the people, it's, it's really written for people who are transitioning from being a philosophy major to going into grad school uh, or a master's degree program in philosophy. So it is wonderful. It is accessible. Uh, and I highly recommend it. And again, there is a, a free copy uh, within my Patreon. And then the one on the right, of course, is the one that I wrote, The Majesty of Reason, A Short Guide to Critical Thinking and Philosophy. So um, I try to synthesize a lot of the stuff in a lot of these other books into this one book. And so really, um, you know, I go through... I go through different intellectual virtues. I go through different biases, you know, that we might have. And I go through, like, tangible strategies. Uh, I think it's, like, 22 tips for um, mitigating such biases and for engaging in discussion. And then I also go into a bunch of philosophical distinctions and ways of evaluating arguments, pinpointing underlying assumptions, drawing out consequences, performing reductios, logic, and a bunch of other things in there. And then finally, in my last three chapters, I kind of apply, uh, which is which is sadly what some of the other books are missing, I go through and apply a lot of the strategies and, and techniques uh, that, uh, articulated earlier in the book, I go on to apply them to... Uh, topics that are of interest to people. So I apply them to scientism. I apply them to uh, the laws of nature. What are laws of nature? I apply them to the nature of the mind. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I recommend, uh, if you're interested in really getting a guide to critical thinking of philosophy, I recommend picking up that one. So the next two out of my list of, of 13 are A Concise Introduction to Logic by Patrick Hurley and Laurie Watson. You know, logic is really the structure of thinking, so in order to have any solid foundation for... Uh, philosophical thinking, you need to have an excellent grasp of logic. And so uh, that's the uh, the text that I recommend there. And then on the right, this one is just, it's beautiful. Uh, it's really, really good. Philosophical devices, proofs, probabilities, possibilities, and sets. So it goes into some really excellent things that you need to understand in order to be able to understand philosophy and philosophy papers. So it talks about, like it says, uh, probabilities. It goes through different um, 
of the fundamental axioms of, of probability theory. Um, it goes through what is what are possibilities, what are possible worlds, uh, de re and de dicto modality. It goes through sets, so what's the notation that philosophers use in sets? What, what's the important information from set theory that you need to know when you're doing philosophy? And so on. And then the last two on my list are, more precisely, The Math You Need to Do Philosophy by Eric Steinhardt. Now, I actually had a discussion with Eric Steinhardt. He's a very, very interesting uh, and, and lovely fellow. And so I, I had a discussion with him on Micah's channel, Crusade Against Ignorance. So if you're interested, you can check that out. It was about one of his papers that he had published in the journal Philosophia, I think that was the journal. Um, but yeah, this book is, is just brilliant. I mean, it goes through um, the things that you need to know with respect to mathematics when you're doing philosophy. So like, what is a function? Um, and what is, you know, what are sets? What is Cantor's theorem? What, uh, what are power sets? Um, all sorts of things that you need to know when you're doing philosophy. Like, you'd be surprised how much this stuff comes up in really significant debates. So for instance, if you, if you, if you follow Josh Rasmussen's work, if he has a, a paper on an argument for or against identity theory or, or a kind of reductive physicalism uh, that uses Cantorian set theory. Uh, he says that, um, you know, for every subset of, you know, physical states or physical properties, uh, there's a unique mental property that can be matched onto them. And so uh, by Cantor's theorem, you can actually show that mental properties outnumber physical properties, or at least positive uh, logically possible mental properties outnumber logically possible physical properties. I'm not here to defend that argument. I'm just here to note that mathematics can help you investigate the fundamental nature of reality, including whether or not you are identical to your brain. And that has ramifications for uh, arguments, some, some arguments from consciousness for God's existence, it has ramifications for an afterlife, it has ramifications for uh, understanding neuroscience, and so on. So um, this is a great introduction to the math that you need to do philosophy. And then the final book on my list is An Introduction to Philosophical Methods by Chris Daly. And so this one just goes through, like, what are thought experiments? Uh, what is conceptual analysis? What, what goes into a good definition? Um, uh, what is, you know, an argument? What goes into a good argument? Uh, and so on. And so, uh, again, this is a, an excellent companion to anyone who wants to be able to understand the various methods or ways of doing philosophy and thinking philosophically. So here is the full list. You can take a screenshot, you can post it everywhere on social media. Uh, I am definitely recommending you do that and, and sharing this video with as many people as possible, of course. But yeah, this is the full list, uh, and I, uh, I hope that this will be a reference video for people in the future when they ask, hey, what books should I use in order to be able to think critically and to be able to think philosophically? Link them to this video. Uh, send them a screenshot of this list. Uh, yeah, so that's really what I suggest. Um, and then finally, this is just a little plug. Um, uh, Stephen Nemesh, my boy, uh, he recently made a video critiquing existential inertia. If you're curious, I have a blog post wherein I responded to that. That happened on October 31st, so that was like, what, Halloween? Like, spooky stuff? Uh, anyway, the videos uh, that are not necessarily in order and not exhaustive that I plan to do in the future. So the next one after this one is either going to be Aquinas' third way in analysis, that's a lecture, or infinite pain and causal finitism, that's a lecture. Not sure which one, but what's highlighted in green is um, in early January, it is very likely that Ryan Mullins, Dr. Ryan Mullins and Dr. Kate Rogers are going to be discussing divine timelessness. So Kate Rogers is a very prominent contemporary defender of a version of uh, classical theism. So she defends divine timelessness. Uh, so they are going to be discussing divine timelessness on my channel, uh, hopefully in early January. And then finally, like, subscribe, turn on that little bell for notifications, consider supporting me on Patreon and helping me pay my rent as a lowly college student, and most importantly, share. I think this video is going to be able to help people understand what philosophy is, why it matters, why it's valuable, and 13 books that they need in order to be able to think critically about the fundamental nature of reality. I'm Joe Schmid, and this is The Majesty of Reason, and as always, peace out.